Okay, we are live again. Uh, as uh, every other Monday, we welcome to the world to the Fab Academy recitations. Uh, today, a very relevant topic for 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 the Fab Labs and for the future of education um, that is going to be um, presented by Silvia Martinez in Fab Education, Fab Learn, and all the work related with high schools, teachers, and how to make this amazing. Um, new technologies getting into the into the classrooms and hosted by uh, our amazing Sherry Lassiter, uh, director of the Fab Foundation and heart and soul of this network. So oh, you're too sweet. <laughs> all yours uh, will be here and um, yeah, I will join you in the discussion. Lass? Okay, ready to go? Okay, um, I'm going to give you all high fab. Hi, Fab community. I'm going to give you all a little bit of history, some of which you know, some of which you don't know, in, uh, in introducing Sylvia, uh, who is very special, I will say. Um, as you know, uh, Fab Lab started um, as an outreach project from MIT's Center for Bits and Atoms back in 2001. And CBA you know, funded that first maybe 12 Fab Labs in the world and now we've grown this network to a crazy more than a thousand in like 78 countries, right? Um, but we've grown up, as we've grown up, we've grown up in tandem with the maker movement. And um, in fact, Fab Labs were featured in the very first maker magaz Make magazine. And um, while Fab Labs started in community centers as places for, say, personal expression, for creating economic opportunity, or for solving local you know, technical challenges, increasingly they've become environments for technical education, and in many cases for advanced technical education. So, um, as both Fab Labs and Makerspaces have grown, um, so too has the pull uh, from the education community. Um, uh, and, um, you know, it's around bringing digital fabrication and computational technologies into education, whether it's formal or informal, primary, secondary, higher education. There's just an enormous pull right now for Fab Labs and makerspaces and in essence digital uh, digital fabrication as catalytic environments for uh, for learning um, and you can this is partially attributable to the rise of personal fabrication and the rapid spread of digital fabrication tools around the world they become cheaper reliable and more possible. I think we got an echo somewhere um, and it's partially based on um, one second probably second mute Sylvia uh, maybe I can put on my headphones and that'll help. <laughs> now it's better. Yeah, yeah, now it's better. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So uh, Fab Labs are kind of an extension of Seymour Papert's ideas of constructionism. So constructionism is kind of a theory of learning um, that learners are, um, learn most effectively when, they, uh, when it's part of an activity or an experience that has personal meaning or by you know, when, when students and learners construct their own learning tools and environments, sort of objects to learn by. Um, if you put Fab Labs in the context of constructionism, you know, constructionism 1.0 was Seymour Papert and um, turtles and logo, uh, you know, the programming the world around them. Um, and then 2.0 might be Resnick and Lego Mindstorms and Scratch, also about programming the world around them. Um, and you might think about uh, uh, Fab Labs uh, and Professor Gershenfeld's work as making, inventing, and programming the world around them. So sort of the next stage in, um, in constructionism. And so Sylvia uh, Martinez is one of the pioneers in this field. She's an educator, an author, and a practitioner of learning by making. And she's part of that, uh, learning by making being sort of the foundation, or part of the foundation of Seymour's uh, theory of constructionism. But Sylvia, like many of us here, I think we could call her a constructionist. Um, she's got a bachelor's uh, degree in engineering and a master's of education. Uh, she spent her early years, you'll love this, um, you know, developing receiver systems and navigation software for GPS, which is pretty cool. <laughs> She's got a long history in educational software development, designing and develop math, uh, developing math-related products, um, and chess, as I understand it. Um, first as an executive producer uh, at Davidson & Associates uh, uh, Knowledge Adventure, where she developed um, 
titles like Math Blaster, and then later as Vice President of Development at Encore Software. Um, during those years, she also did some really other cool things. She developed Math.com, a website that provides uh, math help to like millions of people around the world, and the first internet service for teachers that kind of provided resources and news and information for them. So she speaks all over the world in education-related conferences, and she's a fabulous thinker and leader in technology and education. So Sylvia, please take it away. Well, thank you. C can you hear me? Good. Okay. Hopefully um, the feedback won't come back. Um, well, thank you, Sherry Tomas. This is a great invitation. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, and yes, I, I've done a lot of things. I've had a lot of jobs um, and, and seen a lot of different kinds of engineering, education, um, you know, technical work throughout the years. Um, I wanted just to share with you guys some of the things that I talk about when I talk to teachers about what fab learns, what fab labs are, what does maker education mean, and the potential to really impact the way that kids learn around the world. Um, so I'm going to share with you some of the things that I that I talk about. I'm, I just have it in a PDF, and I'm going to share my screen if that works. So let me let's see where is that. Top left, yeah. Top left, chat, screen chat. There it is. Um, okay, it's not coming up. It's one of the choices. Let me just share the entire screen. How's that? Can you see my my slides? Yes, perfect. Okay, so um, first of all, I wanted to to. to uh, Share with. I wanted to share my my geek cred with you guys. Um, this is me wearing a shirt back when I was in aerospace engineering, and the shirt says "Friends don't let friends do DOS." And if you don't know what DOS is, just find an old person like me and and ask them. But um, that was that was a time in my life that was that was very exciting. Working on the GPS satellite navigation system was something that I did right out of college. I got an electrical engineering degree right when computers became you know, small and being able to be Im embedded into things. And the GPS system was something that was was just a theory. When um, I took the job, they said, you know, the math is really only a theory. The receivers aren't fast enough. The software doesn't exist. The computers that we're going to write the software for don't exist yet either. But yet we're going to do this. And, you know, now it's in my car and in my phone, and I don't know how people get along without it anymore. I barely remember what it was like. And I was part of a very large team working on something that was not even was not only impossible, but it didn't even exist. The question didn't exist, much less the answer we came up with. And that's how I know that kids in school today, that people in fab labs today, are going to be doing things that we don't even know the questions yet to ask. So the most important thing to do is to prepare people to accept the invitation to do the impossible. And to me, the maker movement and fab labs are are doing that. It's this kind of collective learning and doing that's spreading all over the world with you know these open ideas and shared ideas. And I really believe that this is part of the next industrial revolution. When I read Neil's book, um, it it really dawned on me that what he was talking about was people doing things for themselves and not waiting for a government or a company to sell them something, but to find a solution and to share it with others and to kind of create this collective problem-solving brain that we can all live in. And to me, that's something that, that educators should be a, a paying attention to. Because, I mean, if we're not looking at learning outside of school, we're going to be left behind on doing learning inside of school. One of the fun things, and if you've ever been to a Maker Faire, I just got back from the Bay Area Maker Faire, 150,000 people there, you know, showing off, wearing costumes, um, building crazy things, building fun things. It's whimsical. It's exciting. And, you know, a lot of parents that I meet at Maker Faire look at their kids and say, my kid's bored. My kid's bored in school, but look at them now. Look how much they're learning and having fun. Why can't school be more like Maker Faire? And I think that's a really important question. And for, to to for too long, we've been telling parents and kids, don't worry, you're going to need this you know, next year. You're going to need this when you get older. 
instead of saying you can be an engineer today, you are an engineer, you are a scientist, and let them do things that are interesting and fun and teach the, the academic skills that we've always wanted to teach. I don't believe that fab labs and maker spaces are important because they teach kids the way the, the science and math we've always wanted them to learn. I think they're important as an illustration of what science and math can be and should be. So um, because we started running into so many parents who you know, and we're asking this question, and teachers who weren't paying attention to the maker movement, uh, my partner Gary Stager and I decided to write a book called Inventola. So we envisioned this as a kind of a bridge between educators and the maker movement for that help them understand the tools and technology that are out there and available that fit nicely into math and science, the way we want kids to express it, and the way that real scientists and engineers use uh, technology in the real world. And you know, it really, to me, helped me come full circle on what digital technology could mean, um, it, you know, to, to in the classroom. Because being an engineer, you know, I'd had a very academic, typical um, education, and I, t I happened to be good at school. But the more I learned about the way people learn, the way people really learn by reading people like Seymour Papert, is that that was just a fluke. I got lucky and it I felt like it was my job to help school not just be for people like me. And this new maker stuff was a way to do that in a way that I'd never envisioned before. So because of this book Gary and I have been able to go around the world speaking to teachers um, everything is on our website that relates to the book and it's been a, an incredible journey the past couple of years introducing teachers to these ideas. Um, one of the things that's happened is we've published other books. People have come to us and said, hey, I've got a great idea for a book, including this 14-year-old super awesome Sylvia who uh, wrote a book and illustrated her book about Arduino, how to make simple Arduino projects. And we've had our book translated into Korean and Japanese and soon to come um, Dutch, Turkish, Arabic, Chinese, and probably a couple more that I'm that I'm hoping to to close soon. So it's just been this fantastic idea. Um, we're 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 doing more books. Um, these books are coming soon. And in fact, the FabLearn book, Meaningful Making. So FabLearn is out of the Stanford Graduate School of Education. Uh, Meaningful Making is already out, and we're doing it in a very unique way. Um, it's free online, so you can go to the the website, the FabLearn website. Uh, download the book, or you can buy it online as well. If you want a nice hard copy, we've uh, you can buy it from Amazon. So um, when I talk to schools, I talk, I kind of try and help them figure out the landscape because I don't think everything is appropriate for schools. There are tools that are too expensive, too dangerous, things that are just toys. We don't want to waste our time on things that are just you know uh, uh, toys. But there are a lot of things that really fit well into helping kids make sense of the world. And to me, that's the most important part of the maker movement, is making sense, not making stuff. In our book, we talk about three of these things and call them game changers. The things we think are the most uh, important tools and technology that are going to help education really come to terms with with 21st century. And that's fabrication, physical computing, and programming. Now I don't have to tell you guys about what these are. I don't have, you know, if, when I talk to teachers, um, some of them have never seen a 3D printer, some of them have just kind of heard of it. In the last three years it's gone from like, you know, 10% of the audience having seen a 3D printer to a lot of them having actual 3D printers in their in their schools, but a lot of them aren't doing very much with them. Um, and you know, I share with them the the databases that are out there, the way the world is coming to 3D printing, like museums are 3D printing their artifacts, so that primary sources really the meaning of primary source is changing. I also share with them the fact that students outside of school are participating in these networks. And if you, you know, I've, I cut this page from Instructables um, from a 14 year old who says, I love teaching, programming, engineering, and learning. And I, you know, I ask, I've asked teachers all over the world, do you think this young man's school knows what he can do? And I get, you know, the teachers just don't think so. 
Because why would he come to school and share that he's interested in these things? The, the, there's, a, there's a gap between what kids learn in school and what school thinks is important and what kids are being invited to do all over the world and how they're joining these communities. And I think those two should can come together. There are schools that are doing this. That are there are schools all over the world who are who are introducing fantastic fabrication programs into into the school day. And you know what I share with with teachers is it's not that we want everybody to go to a three D printer lab, print out an identical keychain, and say, well there we have it. We're we've done maker because that's not going to change anything. Um, there are ways that kids learn and they understand the world better. Um, you know, this seventh grader who that's about 13 years old said, you know, it seems so complicated, but wait, it's just shapes. You know, we want kids to have that understanding in their head that they can break down any problem that they see. They can solve it. They can contribute to a global group of people who are working on those same problems and that there are people out there who are acting as connectors like this website enabling the future connecting people who have 3d printers to people who who, who need things like prosthetics um, so the second game changer I talk about is physical computing and that's this you know big bucket of stuff uh, everything from robotics to wearables to the internet of things um, the a lot of schools are you know going to iPads and throwing away computers that could be absolutely wonderful for for the kids to hack to open to you know embed in other things I talk about um, wearable technology not just as a you know as something cool which it is but it's a way to do exactly the same thing as you could with an Arduino or a robot where different kinds of kids are being invited to the party and they're doing exactly the same things they're designing, they're programming, they're troubleshooting, they're you know learning electronics, they're learning about sensors and feedback through something that interests them. So I'm not saying that you know all girls like wearables and sewing and all boys like robots, that would be crazy, um, but anytime you can offer different kinds of on-ramps, whether it's whimsical artistic projects or projects that change the world, those are sign language reading gloves, uh, ballet slippers that track dance movement, games, toys, you know, real inventions, I think that it just opens the doors to more kids to see that they have the capacity to understand this most complex piece of, of technology and things that are going to change their world. So programming is the third game changer. That's sort of a sneaky way to get it in to reemphasize this idea that I think programming is the, the, the most important skill the most important mindset that you can have that you can change the world and that you can master this most important you know invention of the 21st century um, I always advocate for programming languages that are were built for learning there's tons of programming languages you can choose many of them are great for doing work but that's different from learning programming in order to think and to explore areas of mathematics and storytelling and multimedia that are just not accessible any other way and that every job now uses programming it's not just you know because you're gonna get a good job as a computer scientist that's fine I don't really love the idea that we're selling programming as a way to get a job I think it's a way to understand the world and the nice thing about teaching something like scratch is it's starting to connect to this ecosystem where you just plug robots in and you get new new palettes um, I think you know teachers wor rightly worry that if you ask the history teacher and the math teacher and the science teacher all to teach programming, they're not going to do it. It's just not going to happen. But if you can create an ecosystem where things like Scratch are something that the kids just come in knowing, um, you know, you're going to get a lot more interesting uh, uses of uh, a lot more fluency from the kids and a lot more interesting uses. Um, so. You may have noticed that the game changes were all about technology. A lot of people looking at the maker movement for schools say things like, oh, well, we'll just have the kids, you know, play around and we're creative and we give them cardboard and they build things and isn't that wonderful? And I'm like, I want to set the bar higher. I want to, um, I want schools to try something, something new and different 
Because if we just keep doing the same thing and calling it by a new name, we're not changing the world. Um, you know, Seymour Papert said, if you can use technology to make things, you can make a lot more interesting things, and you can learn a lot more by making them. And when Seymour said technology, I'm pretty sure he meant the computer, and he meant programming. Um, you know, th th this idea that just by touching something, by making all by itself, it, it, you create learning opportunities is an interesting first step, but it's not the last step. And it's certainly not the most complex step that I think schools should be making towards, you know, living in the modern world. Now, that's not to say that there aren't a lot of fantastic things to do. I think a lot of schools, you can just sort of ask them to think about expanding their toolkit. Um, things like cardboard construction, but make a cardboard robot. Make something with something, you know, a complex uh, infrastructure. Um, there's all these new conductive materials, everything from squishy circuits, conductive uh, dough and paint. These girls in the picture here have painted their own keyboard for a piano they've built. Um, these are 10-year-olds. You guys know this. It's not hard to do. You just have to let kids have ideas and build things and keep pushing the, um, uh, the kids forward towards big ideas. So there's, you know, uh, sewing with electronics, there's paper with electronics. Um, the Makey Makey is a fantastic kind of starter set for a lot of fab labs because it lets people work both on the digital and the, the um, outs, you know, the physical computing side without a lot of software or electronics knowledge. And I think that when kids can use these tools to invent and we let them invent, like this is a little ring toss carnival game. Um, somebody's gone to town with Scratch, somebody's built a, a fun game connected with Makey Makey, and suddenly you have, you know, a real thing that other kids can play and you can enhance. Um, I think that by offering lots different kids lots of different on-ramps, we really, you know, make it accessible. And, you know, I tell the teachers when I do professional development, it's so easy, even adults can do it. So they, they can relax. It's not like they need to study up and learn everything and then let the kids do it, they can become learners too. And I think that's a really important concept when we're talking about um, a new kind of learning organization is it's not the teacher dispensing all the, the knowledge, they're not the guru at the front of the room, um, that they're learning alongside with the students. And a lot of teachers telling are telling me they're having the most fun they've ever had in their careers. And I think that passion is is crucial when you want to transfer it to kids. So, you know, it's not that I think it's only for science and technology. I think making is important in all subjects. Um, there's a teacher named Heather Pang at the Castilea School in California. They have an amazing fab lab in their school. Um, she's a history teacher. So she teaches history by making things. For example, they have a, this monument project, and the, the, the uh, kids in her class build a monument to a famous person. And what she says is not that they're learning history by using a laser cutter, but the conversations they have about history as they're making something that feels real to them um, are, are the best conversations she has, she's ever had in her career as a history teacher. Um, how do you represent history? Is it literal? Is it figurative? When you walk up to a, a monument, what do you see? What do you feel? And how do you make that come alive? Is about making and it's about being a historian because that's what historians really do. So um, I think that there's a lot of people who ask me then, well, is it just electronics? Is it just fabrication? You know, I, I, I teach biology. I teach chemistry. What about those other things? And, of course, you know, bio is the new digital, as Nicholas Negroponte has said. I think there's new outposts of the maker movement that are going to really help schools grasp the whole of what's going on out there. Um, I did like a biohacking workshop at Stanford last, last summer. It was kind of crazy. Um, you guys know a, lo a lot about this. There's things that are happening with architecture and organic materials. There's a lot of things happening with citizen science. Um, this is a fold foldable microscope. It's, you know, origami and a little ball lens. Um, figuring out how to do all kinds of things that are important in the world and bringing it back to school. I just came back from the Intel Science and Engineering Fair. I can tell you like a third of the projects were about synthetic biology, you know, rebooting cells, programming cells, 
uh, emergent machine learning, all kinds of things that we're just not teaching in schools. And it shouldn't be only the, the domain of kids who are these super geniuses. I think lots of kids are interested in this. So the big question when I talk to schools is can they do it? Because a lot of places, you know, school really hasn't changed much. We, you know, how do we fit all these brand new things in there? And they get they get kind of overwhelmed by the te the terminology. They don't know what to pick. They don't know where to start. They don't know where to do it. How does it fit in the schedule? So there's lots of logistical questions that they tend to ask me. Um, and I certainly wish I could just give them a blueprint and you know be done with it. But that's not the way this works. Um, they have to construct their own solutions just like the kids do. And it's a, it's, a, it's a process. What I do tell them, though, is to start with the learning. And I talk about constructionism. I talk about Piaget. I talk about Seymour Papert, that the way to construct new knowledge is to build on your existing knowledge. And that the best way to do this is through making artifacts you can share with other people, artifacts that are important to you and important to the community that, that you exist in. Um, you know, I do worry about schools. They're always trying to find the magic wand. Um, you know, how are we going to just make all kids pass all the tests? And they do dumb things sometimes. Like, this is a headline that says, why is Hoboken throwing away all of its student laptops? Hoboken is a city in New Jersey. Well, I can tell you why. It's because they didn't think about learning. They went shopping. So they went out and bought a bunch of laptops, and then they went, oh, what are we going to do with these? And I worry that in three years, five years, there's going to be headlines all over that say, why is Hoboken throwing away all 3D printers? Oh, because 3D printing didn't change education. I guarantee you 3D printing will not change education. It's what the kids are capable of comprehending, of doing. It's what the kids think of themselves as learners that is possible to change. If we look at 3D printers not just as another thing for the kids to learn, but as a tool for them to, to put into their backpack, to become fluent in. Um, and I think that the way we do that is by following smart people like Neil Gershenfeld and Sherry Lassiter and Seymour Papert, who talk about creating conditions for invention rather than providing ready-made knowledge. And for some teachers, this is very difficult. The role, especially in the United States, of teachers has become as dispensers of knowledge and givers of tests. And that's not going to help kids really comprehend this future, where we not only don't know the answers, we don't know the questions. So I encourage schools to think of their spaces as places that are as flexible as possible, that invite sense-making, that give kids agency, that have this low threshold, high ceiling, and not just spaces, but materials as well. So try and buy things and create spaces that do all, all of these things. And don't forget to add things like measurement and prediction and analysis. You know, building a robot out of cardboard is great, but designing something that actually works, that you can is predictable, that you can analyze the, the, the outcomes using measurement tools, learning how to use sensors, I think that's the real power of the maker movement. Um, you know, in the book we talk a lot about a design process that works in the classroom, the iterative design process that you're doing something many times, but it's not doing over. And that's where the computer comes in because, you know, save as I think is probably the most important design uh, tool of the, 20, uh, of the computer of the 21st century. Um, you know, in schools a lot of times they tend to sort of do technology. It's like, um, we're going to do robots in October, and we're going to do programming in November, and we're going to do, you know, um, keyboarding in December, and we're going to, you know, so they do stuff to kids. They never let them get good at something. Because you know when a craftsman uses tools and materials, that's how they understand the craft, the craftsmanship. It, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to explain when schools are so busy trying to do too much to kids that sometimes backing off and doing less is actually more. You know, carpenters don't pick a tool and then do a job. It's all of a piece. You know, we don't say, hey, it's Hammer Thursday. Let's use hammers. No, they choose, they choose their tools because it makes sense and because they know and they love their tools. Um, you know, I'm constantly talking about where to go, places to get help. There's Twitter. There's websites. There's Google Groups. Um, there's books coming out. Um, Harvard's Agency by Design has a lot of fantastic resources and 
students are doing this, they should be brought into the community. Parents often um, have amazing talents that don't get get aren't valued by school, um, or parents don't feel like what they can do with a lathe or a hammer um, really matters. Uh, inviting those parents into the community, I think, is a very powerful statement. So you know, the thing, the big thing I try and leave with schools is that making in the classroom isn't about a shopping list and it's not a special place or a special room. It's a stance towards learning that gives kids agency over themselves and over an increasingly complex world so that they can be in charge, that they're, um, that they're the ones who can do this. And the nice thing is, is there's lots of people out there helping. You know, schools tell me, oh, we can't because the colleges demand, you know, this or that, or well, we can't because the parents or the politicians demand these tests. Well, I think that can change, and the more ammunition that we can present that this is the way that people really learn, and this is the way real uh, engineers, scientists, historians, paleontologists, archaeologists, that's how they really do their jobs using these modern tools. So it's, it's really great when MIT adds a maker portfolio to its admission process, um, it's really great when people like Intel put out things like, um, you know, these reports that talk about how girls and women are engaged by doing real research, have, making, you know, relevant things in the real world, and helping girls stay in pathways that lead to computer science and engineering. It's great when people like, you know, Paolo at, at Blickstein at Stanford University uh, and the Lehman Center do these, you know, do these studies and talk about what are research-based practices that improve student learning and come up with the finding that the number one thing is active learning practices. You know, so we can weave this background of you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, of research, of you know, understanding that kids learn with their heads, their hands, and their hearts all together and you know, talk to real kids. Um, I love being on the same side as Stanford and MIT in a you know global fab lab group, and you know I love that. But what I really hear is when kids say to me, "I look at the world differently now. I I, I see, and they're they're they've changed their perception of themselves and their perception of what they can do in the world. And I think that's very empowering. And I'll just wrap up. Um, you know, I go to a lot of technology conferences, I go to a lot of education conferences, and people tell me all the time, oh, you're so right, technology is so engaging and so empowering, and I don't think that's quite right. I think it's close, but not quite right. Um, I think that doing powerful things is empowering, and you're engaged by, by doing these powerful things and being in a community that you care about and that cares about you, and to me, that's the definition of citizenship. It's this cycle of empowerment and trust, of doing something that gives you voice um, and that helps you see yourself in a different light, of stepping up and surprising everyone, including yourself, about what you're capable of doing. And that's true empowerment. And I also know that you can't have empowered kids without empowered teachers and empowered adults around them, people who are willing to, to trust kids, to hand power to kids, and to nurture them and watch them and point them in the right directions. I don't think that this is important because, oh, we're just going to put out a lot of fabulous stuff and the kids are going to do amazing things. Just, you know, step back and watch the magic happen. I think that's really wrong. I think the community aspect, the, the educators, the parents, the students, everyone working together and learning that, there's, that empowerment is about everyone in the community is so important. And it's crucial that teachers have power over their classrooms, over their makerspaces, over their, over their curriculum, um, or else there's just no way to have empowered students without empowered teachers. Um, so Gary Steger and I run a lot of events all over the world. Um, one coming up is a four-day summer institute in New Hampshire. Uh, we have speakers, but most of the time, the teachers spend the time doing fabulous projects. They work with Lego, they build things, they make stuff that lights up. Uh, they have a fantastic time, and it puts them in the mindset of being a learner again. We ask them deliberately, take off your teacher hat. Don't think about curriculum. Don't think about how this is going to play out in the classroom. Be a learner. Feel what that feels like, and then we'll talk about 
how the classroom is going to work to make this happen. Because when they have that feeling and they start to feel like the, the, the wonderful, having of wonderful ideas, as, as Eleanor Duckworth said, um, I think that they can then take a fresh look at their own classrooms, question the things that need to be questioned, and uh, move forward in a way that really helps kids and is really going to change education for the better um, in this century. So I uh, want to open this up to questions and have some time to talk to you guys. I know you're doing fantastic work all over the world. If you'd ever like to get a hold of me, I'm absolutely easy to get a hold of. I'm on Twitter. You can email me. Um, you can go look at my website at adventtolearn.com. That's for the book. Or my personal website is sylviamartinez.com. And if you send an email to friend at adventtolearn.com, you'll be added to our email list. And, you know, we do new books and resources and send out email every once in a while, not very often. Um, so I really believe that, that the world can be a better place and that the people who care about it and want to make it a better place can make it happen, um, including kids, including teachers, including parents, including everyone. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. Uh, I would love to talk to you guys more. So Sherry, I will hand it back over to you. Thank you, Sylvia. Oh, it's just it's just incredible the work you're doing, and we we so appreciate your being here today. Um, I do have a bunch of questions, but I just kind of wanted to uh, preface this with um, a little bit of the work that's going on uh, with the foundation and with um, the education community in the Fab Lab Network, uh, both for your information so that maybe we found a new collaborator, <laughs> uh, but also for those who aren't necessarily educators in this group today. So um, uh, through the Fab Foundation, we um, several years ago uh, started a project called Fab Ed, and really Fab Ed was about building uh, a community of practice around digital fabrication in the classroom. And um, we, I think we gathered several times uh, together as an international community and a national community, uh, meaning the U.S., uh, to, to think about what we thought teachers needed to learn. And it turns out that, that ori those original thoughts were great about you know, how, you, how you become a maker yourself, but they really weren't very realistic in terms of, of what teachers need and the kinds of resources they need. So really, Fab Ed is um, trying to bring coherence to a very distributed and um, independent <laughs> uh, community of practitioners and also pioneers. I mean, we are talking about pioneers out there. Um, uh, this is by no means at scale uh, in terms of teachers and uh, schools uh, using digital fabrication uh, in the classroom or making in the classroom. And um, it's not, uh, every single school seems to start from scratch, you know, and it's, it's extraordinarily painful for every teacher at every, every school. And so we want to be able to help that. And we know that there are great projects going on around the world that, can, that are, are starting to do that. Um, uh, so specifically, um, Ties the Teaching Institute for Excellence in STEM, along with the Fab Foundation, we're working. We're working on several models of professional development uh, and testing those out. We tested some out last year. We're testing some out this year, um, and um, it, it turns out that no two communities, no teaching, no two, two com teaching communities are exactly alike. So, kind of the same lessons from digital fabrication and mass customization is it's the same. We have to figure out how to customize for you know for for all these many. Uh, different um, different populations. Um, there's a great uh, project in Brazil right now called Fab Education, and um, that is uh, it sounds like it's very aligned with what you're doing in your summer workshops, um, and also with the work of Paulo uh, Blickstein out at Stanford, um, in that it's gathering sort of pioneering teachers together to um, to work on activities and share the development of those activities as both learners and teachers um, and then take that back to the classroom to, um, uh, to inspire their, their children. Um, there's a, a project called Fab Lat Kids in, uh, also in South America um, which is aimed at um, finding activities uh, that are really fun and engaging in which uh, in essence children uh, construct their own learning tools, you know, so they might be through an object, it might be, say, through building a chair, uh, for instance, and customizing a chair, but these are objects through which children learn, and it's a beautiful project that's growing very rapidly down in South America. Um, India, we have a beautiful, um, there's a, 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 
uh, Yogesh Kulkarni is doing really amazing work with um, rural children and working with uh, uh, the university. Uh, the uh, sorry, Indian Institute of Technology in um, Mumbai, amongst others, to develop really, really nice curriculum and programs for kids. Um, Iceland also, actually through their innovation centers, is is working on it, and Spain has got a, a, a has got quite a um, uh, a lot of work going on right now. And the Fab Foundation, what we're trying to do is start to gather all this amazing work and and um, try to pull it into sort of a coherent. Uh, in a, in a place and in a way that's coherent and useful to the global um, global network. So, so that's the kind of work that we're doing um, right now. Um, I have a couple of questions for you <laughs> that I'd like Shoot. to start, if I may. You know, absolutely. Um, so, um, one of the things that you talk about in your incredible book is um, the idea of making tinkering and engineering. So, sort of making as you know, kind of. In the physical world, learning the tools and processes, tinkering is the exploration and the way that you're starting to form knowledge, and engineering kind of as the way that you pull all those pieces together into deeper knowledge. Um, so, you know, this is this making tinkering engineering is kind of a way to understand the world, as you say, or making sense of the world. You know, traditional education separates, right, all of yeah. this art. Science, tech, theory, practice, all of that. Sorry, there's a, a <laughs> phone in the background here. Um, but um, uh, but those, but as you say in your book, those divisions are artificial. The real world just doesn't work that way. It's interdisciplinary. How you know? How do? What do you do for deeper disciplinary knowledge? So you know, we have activities and they draw on different disciplines. But you know, what happens to disciplinary knowledge and disciplinary learning in this environment? Does this represent a pathway to geeking out, or is there a, a, a different kind of approach for um, a deeper disciplinary knowledge? How, how do you how do you see it playing out in this environment? Um, well, I, I certainly think there's a there's a place for deeper disciplinary knowledge. I think. What's happened in many schools is we've we've reversed. We've put the cart before the horse. We front try and front load the kids with a lot of disciplinary knowledge, and they have no idea why, right? And we've kind of forgotten why as well, you know. And they say, well, why do I need to know this? And we say, oh, I don't know. You might use it next year, instead of being able to answer that question. That's the most important question in the entire world, and we we you know we dismiss kids as if they're you know they're just being silly. Um, I think we have to find interesting projects for kids. Um, you know, we talk a, a lot about our books about prompts and challenges being the the unit instead of we're going to you know we're going to tell you about fractions and then we're going to do it you know do work on fractions and we're going to you know we need to find ways where kids are actually using these things in the real world. So so there's two answers. One is to create interesting projects and challenges where kids are push towards bigger ideas where they need, because of their own curiosity about things, need these bigger ideas. So let me give you an example that's not like engineering. Um, a friend of mine is a teacher and they live in, the, the, the school is in a, an amazing rural place and um, what they do is they, they, could, they um, build a box and they study the, the, you know, everything that fits inside the box. So animals that wander through and stuff like this. And what they do is they let the kids sort these animals, plants, everything that's in this box into, into their own taxonomy. So the kids say things that run, things that walk, things that fly versus things that don't. And then, then they start asking questions, well, isn't there a better way to do this? And the answer is yes. That's when you talk about species and genus and the way that biologists and you know people have organized these things not try and and do it before the kids have any interest in these things. So I think that by creating interesting challenges for kids, you're asking them, you're inviting them to become interested. I think we also have to be a lot more flexible in what we teach kids. Is that some kids can go very deep into a subject and there's this magic time, you know, like between 10 and 15, 10 and 18 where kids are just sponges. I mean, they're so eager to figure out who they are, to figure out their place in the world, and it's the perfect time for them to go deep into a subject. And instead in schools we do the exact opposite. We give them this little tour of things that don't matter to them, and we expect them to stay interested. And the few kids that can sort of maintain this, this level of interest because they're good kids, 
you know, what else do they have to do with their time? We call them smart, we reward them with A's, and then we let them go to engineering school, or, you know, or become scientists. And I think we're losing a lot of kids that way. I think there's, the, of the flip side, the second answer is, we're teaching a lot of stuff that just doesn't matter. And we just have to be, we just have to be so much more serious about looking at the math and science curriculum that we're teaching kids and asking, is this really necessary? And the answer, the answer is often it's not really that necessary, but we've, we've developed a fondness for the classics. You know, we love logarithms, we, you know, and we teach them. Why? Uh, you know, somebody, I, I know that some people will love that, but good, let them teach it. Not every classroom has to be the same. Not every school has to be the same. And that's a very difficult idea for, for people to, to allow. But I really feel like when you're a constructionist, you have to be a constructionist all the way. It's, it's yes, it's hard for people to construct their own curriculum. They have to do it. You can't do curriculum to teachers just the same as you can't do math to kids. Um, they have to construct their own curriculum or else they don't understand the fundamentals of what they're doing. And you're in fact disempowering teachers when you're, you're just trying to be helpful. It's the same for teachers, it's the same for kids, it's the same for everybody. It's the same for communities of practice. You can't just say, you're a makerspace, here you go, here's the box, oh makerspace, do it. Everyone is gonna to come to this at their own speed and their own pace. I think we lost Sherry, did we lose Sherry? Yeah, we lost, we lost Sherry, but I want to, to, to continue the thread oh, with the, oh, she's back. Lass is back. Lass? Well, go okay. ahead. Yeah, well, I want to continue and also link it to one of the questions that people is popping out. By the way, there are a lot of questions for you in, our, in, our, in the Google Plus channel. Uh, but it's, it's one connected with uh, one, the first question by Dennis Conner. Uh, and I think it really makes a, a, a really nice thread, which is um, you were talking about challenging kids uh, in terms of the way they're learning by challenges and not by fixed uh, tasks, let's say, no? Mm -hmm. So how, how far can we go with those challenges? How far can kids be engaged with the local communities and learn not only while, while doing something, but actually while solving something which has a major, a major significance for, for their context, let's say? Well, I, I think that's, a, that's a, you know, something that people are really trying to do is make learning relevant um, mm -hmm. and solving real problems. I mean, that's why people come to Fab Labs is, they have ideas, they want to change the world. I mean, every kid wants to change the world. Every kid mm -hmm. wants to be a superhero. Um, and we can let them, it, it doesn't have to be imaginary with a cape, I can fly kind of superhero. It uh -huh. can be, I can do something that really impacts my community. You know, we've created schools, we put kids in them, we segregate them by age, we put them in a room with an adult and say, you know, at some point we're going to let you back into into the community, and I think we've just done a, we've done a disservice to the kids, and we do a disservice to to the, the world. Um, you know, these kids are fantastic and passionate. They're going to think of things in in a way that they never thought of before. And like I said, I'm not talking about this as being magic. Um, mm -hmm. It takes adults. It takes adults who really care about kids. We're willing to look kids in the eye and talk to the kids about them, not just lecture at them, not just say you can do anything in some sort of, you know, uh, greeting card kind of way, but really, really work with kids and be a part of, of, the, of the learning community. So, and, and again, keeping the connection with the next question, I want to keep a thread. I will try to do this. And by Joao Leao from Portugal. He asked uh, how, how hard are, uh, is to convince the parents? What the parents think? How, how are they part, how, how much are they part of the formula? And how can be sometimes a limitation or sometimes, uh, let's say more, more or less, I'd see the, the empowering uh, sure. parents they should be. So I think you're, you're articulating that there's two sides of this. Mm -hmm. School is a culture. We all mm -hmm. went to school, we all know what's supposed to happen. Even people who were damaged by school come back as parents and demand the same thing for their kids. I think in the schools that I see that are successfully doing this, there's, there's two things that happen. And one is the parent communication. You have to constantly message to parents that this, that this maker stuff isn't 
what you do when the real work is done. You have to constantly message about how scientists and engineers really work in the real world and that this tinkering idea, this process matches that, that, um, you know, we're not shortchanging the kids. This is academic, this is rigorous. Um, and then the second thing that people do, that pe successful schools do, is include students as leaders. Mm -hmm. um, teach students to mentor each other, to be peer mentors, to be leaders. It's not only good, you know, psychologically for you to see someone who's your peer or near peer um, showing leadership in this kind of stuff. It really does help the teachers. I mean, who can keep track of all this stuff? Mm -hmm. There's there's nobody better than like a 15 year old to understand like every version of the Arduino and you know keep track of the operating systems the BIOS great let them do that you're in charge but you actually have to give them actual power you can't say you're in charge until I overrule you it really becomes a more negotiated um, existence in schools and there's there's people all the time who are going to say why is your classroom so noisy why aren't the kids all doing the same thing? There's, there's a lot of people who truly believe that all kids doing the same thing at exactly the same time is the way people learn. And it's, it's constant. You have to educate parents. You have to say it not once, not 20 times. You have to say it every day. Every time you see a parent, you have to say, this is real education. You can't get, I, you can't get tired of hearing yourself say it and think, oh, they're they've heard me say this a thousand times you have to keep saying it keep telling the kids because by the time kids are 10 years old they've decided what school is they've decided that school is boring and you know that they just have to get through it and some kids accept that and some kids just sort of turn off and some kids openly rebel and I think we can make we can change that but we have to kind of de-school unschool everybody in the system Last, you dropped out. Do you want to um, do you want to continue with questions? I was I was reading questions from the from the audience. They were, sure. there, are, there are a lot. But go well, ahead, last. I don't want to I don't want to monopolize the audience. I guess. <laughs> so <laughs> please go ahead. Well, we we have another nice question from Joao, and I think that it refers to your book and it's specific to a page. He says in page sixty five. <laughs> you say, oh, great. For some of <laughs> projects create memories for students. Uh, and the question is, don't you think that this is directly related to the EQ, which is an emotional quotient, being more important than IQ? Well, I, I think both of those are kind of are kind of made up terms. Um, you know, I think people are smart in lots of different ways, and I think that people need to be connected. To things that they care about, mm -hmm. um, you know. I don't think one is more important than the other. I don't believe in teaching in in teaching kids about emotions. I think all of that happens in the context of doing real things. You know, I, I, I worry when people have like, you know, rallies and they they cheer and they think, kids, you can do anything. That's great. But then they th there's no follow up. There's no actual things that the kids are allowed to do that they care about. I think that kids are almost always open to interesting learning. Um, and when people are passionate and you're in a community and you're doing things together and you have a common goal, kids will almost always step into that invitation. And I think that's what creates their emotional intelligence and their emotional well-being, not teaching them emotional intelligence. I, 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 you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm old-fashioned. Um, I think it happens as a result. It's not a thing you deliver to kids. Last, go ahead. You go ahead now. Me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so hmm. Hmm. so many things you bring up. Um, uh, one of the things I was curious about. Um, oh, good question. question. What a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about um, activities versus curriculum, and is there a cross-disciplinary curriculum? Or is digital fabric or a digital fabrication curriculum, or is it really is this really just a series of activities that support different curricula? You know, can you think with us about yeah. that? Um, mm -hmm. Look, this is this is very tough. I've spent you know 25 years trying to help teachers do things in their classrooms that are, that really break out of the box. Um, if you give them nothing, they won't know what to do. 
if you over prescribe you're not helping them develop their own agency and autonomy over the curriculum so but in between I think there's actually a lot and I think that you not only have to deliver help them with curriculum and make it a little less um, prescriptive try and make it as as open as possible but still explaining what you're doing and I think there has to kind of be a, a, a meta level where you're helping the teacher understand why you're doing things like why would you have a conversation before you let the kids do something why would you let the kids make in, in, when they're just gonna mess around and they don't know the tools and I don't have you know I haven't lectured yet so you have to help the teachers understand the meta level of what you're asking them to do and explain it in very concrete terms. You know, let the kids mess around and then do, you know, give them a prompt. Um, and then the teachers will stray, will will start to internalize that, and when they feel comfortable, they're, they'll start to stop reading the directions. So the the good thing is, is when they stop reading your curriculum, which is not. A good feeling for a curriculum writer. It's like you're watching your babies, you know, fly out of the nest. It's a good thing. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, I, I would think that evaluation would be re pretty tough in this environment. I mean, it's a it's a nasty question, but you know, how do you how do you evaluate when learners learn differently? They learn in different time frames, and they're not necessarily on your schedule. Mm -hmm. you know, do you have any thoughts about what the future of evaluation looks like? Um, I think it, it looks a lot more like uh, you know the authentic evaluation that we do for kids in art class or or a, 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 an orchestra or writing you know not every kid writes the same poem and yet somehow teachers develop the capacity to look at poetry to look at an essay and say I can see your ideas here's where you can develop them you know this this constant cycle of feedback rather than a test at the end of the day um, you know, it really, it really challenges people to take a hard look at what their assessments are really giving them. Just because we've always done it this way, and really we haven't done it that way for very long, it's just in our memories, we've all taken tests, so that must be the way. That's not really, if you look at the, you know, wider span of history, that's really not how people have learned and shown how they know what to do. Um, you know, apprenticeship it was much more prevalent for centuries. Um, so we kind of have to question that we're getting what we think we're getting out of assessment. We have to push back when people say, well, they didn't know, you know, which, what were the three factors that started World War II? Well, you know, let's have a conversation about World War II. Well, and then I can tell you after the conversation what you need to know. I can give you an interesting book. I can say why did you know you hear there's someone who actually fought in World War II let's go have a conversation with them let's make a video about their life let's talk about it but you know that takes more time and at the end of the day they're still not going to pass the question about what were the three causes of World War II so if we don't question the assessment first we're never going to be able to change the way that we that we work in the classroom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. last I, I want to read a question from India this is from Prandia Shindekar. Hello. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a context contextual question. No? If, um, how is your experience with, the, with rural schools? Girls? If, uh, rural, rural schools, like uh, not in urban areas, but in the rural areas. Rural, area. rural. Oh, okay. yeah. rural schools. Um, yeah, I mean, rural schools have, have a lot of challenges. They often are, you know, kids have, have a tough time getting to them. They're under-resourced. The teachers may not have a, a, a wide range of experiences. Um, you know, you, you don't have a lot of choice if you're in a very rural area. Um, I think that every school has to grapple with these differences and come up with their own solutions. I think that helping teachers see different ways by having like mentor schools where teachers can go for maybe a short stay, maybe six months or a year. And, and work in different kinds of schools and then bring that back to their own area and say, you know, I saw some things there that are going to work here. And, you know, have the capability of changing what they're doing in schools. Um, it, it's, it's not an easy question. Um, I don't think the answer is just telling these teachers what to do. I think that that's, um, feels like it's the only way to do it. But, I, you know, like I said, 
Um, I think you have to be, if you're a constructionist, you have to be a constructionist all the way, even when it's hard. Okay, I think I covered most of the questions. Lars, you have uh, some closing comments? We are, we are in our hour of session. Well, I guess um, my, my closing comments would be thank you for, for uh, thank you, Sylvia, for helping us think about this. There's lots to think about it. I, uh, 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 you know, everything from, you know, curriculum versus evaluation versus how do you scale? You know, if you've got a lot of teachers that, um, you know, that aren't a part of this movement uh, and that need to be maybe or you'd like for them to be, you know, do, how do you scale? How do you, right now we're, it seems like we're all working with the willing, right? Right. The willing and the pioneers, but not necessarily with right. the rest. And so, you know, how do you scale in meaningful ways is a really tough one that I hope that you'll help us think about as we go forward. Well, I, you know, I think that the model, there's, a, there's actually a good model that, that we should be looking at, um, which I think is, is the sort of slow food uh, micro farming movement, um, where the idea of scale is, is that small solutions create big, big change. Um, you know, the U.S. is obsessed with scale. You know, we're like, we built the highways and we're going <laughs> to massive, everything has to be massive. And it's like, I don't think you can massive this. I, I really think that you have to implement small changes and uh, deliberate changes and empower people to make changes in their community that's right for their community. I don't think there's a way to scale this in the sort of classic American go big or go home kind of sense. Um, I really do think that, that the, 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 the farming community actually has a lot of lessons that, that we could be taking advantage of. Huh. That's wonderful. I think that's right in alignment with the Fab Lab community. <laughs> we are, so, we are yeah. farmer, yeah. Farmer, farmers of the future. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Mine farmers. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, both of you, thank you, Lath. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for sharing with, with the network. Um, yeah. Well, thank you, network, for being here. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, you guys, it's for like inviting me. This is so exciting. I, I think you guys are doing the most amazing work in the whole world. And, <laughs> you know, hey, changing the world isn't easy, might be impossible, but we got to do it anyway, because what else are we going to do, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank you so much. And, uh, right. well, I see you next week. Uh, we, we have the last recitation, the coming week with Carl Bass, CEO of Autodesk, and we'll close this season. Um, thank you again, and see you soon, everyone. Bye, Bye -bye. everybody. Ciao, ciao.